Welcome to SVG TV News for Wednesday, January 31st, 2018. I am Jennifer Richardson with the details. Members of the opposition and parliament today stood their ground wanting to debate their no confidence motion against the ruling Unity Labour Party administration despite strong resistance from members on the government bench. The opposition members voiced strong objections to the government's move to amend the motion to become a debate on the government's performance, thereby deflating the opposition's motion. Newly appointed Senator K. Bacchus Batiste highlighted the importance for debate on the motion as necessary for democracy. She referenced Section 47 of the Constitution and Rule 32.8 of Erskine and Mays. She, start, she stated that motions are usually brought forth to address issues relating to a delinquent economy and scandals. She purported that the government changes the motion, changes in the motion were not simply amendments, but were rather blatant major changes. She said if the government wanted to tout their horn, they should have brought forward their own motion. If you want to bring a confidence motion, you have to give notice. We have brought our no confidence motion. You cannot amend our motion to make it irrelevant. It's a substantive am amendment that would negate our no confidence motion under the Constitution. We are a democratic society. We cannot make mockery of no, of no confidence motion. Erskine May on parliamentary procedure speaks about no confidence motions and the purpose for it. It is when you have poor economics situation in the country generally and scandals. That's a general thing about motions. So when you bring in no confidence motion, how can you amend it to bring a confidence? You don't want to hear me. I know that. If you want to bring a confidence, a no confidence motion, how can you amend it? Oh, I can wait for the noise and then to stop and then I will see. It's a substantive motion. What a substantive motion. Complete the thought, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am saying, Mr. Speaker, that what you're proposing is not constitutionally correct when we're here to, uh, to debate a no confidence motion. It will make a mockery, as I've said already, of our democracy and all debates in re relation to standing motion because we would be wasting time de debating, first of all, exactly what they will stand up and say in debate of the no confidence. This is just time wasting. It does, it is no, it does not follow under Section 47 and the purpose of Section 47. Also protesting the amendments made was opposition leader Dr. Godwin Friday. He was of the view that the changes or amendments in the motion totally shifted the importance of the debate of no confidence in the government to how excellent the government had been performing, which he made clear was not what their motion was about. What has happened here is a substantive motion. This is not an amendment, Mr. Speaker, by any interpretation of the word. This cannot be an amendment where even the title of the motion is changed. Every clause in our motion has been negated by stating the opposite. How is that an amendment? That is a new motion. If they want to debate, they have had many motions here. They have motions on everything from anything that the government has done. They praise themselves in this house. Sometimes we have participated, sometimes we have not. They can bring that motion next week. They can bring it some other time if they want to. They can have during the time when we have private members bill has precedence in the house. They could have a private member bring it up that, at that time, which they have done repeatedly. So, it is my view, it is our view on this side, Mr. Speaker, that we do not get to a debate of the motion as you're proposing until the threshold for 25A has been met, and it has not been met because the motion as proposed, the amendment as proposed violates 32.8. So we do not get to a debate. However, Prime Minister Dr. Rav Gonsalves was unwavering in his argument that the motion must be modified or amended to have flexibility. Citing from Erskine and Mays, which is the authority on parliamentary rules, PM Gonsalves outlined that an alternative must be put forward to have the government side say why the motion put forward by the opposition is irrelevant. Object of an amendment may, either, may be either to modify a question in such a way as to increase its acceptability or to present the House 
a different proposition as an alternative to the original question. That is, it doesn't matter because you murmur, you know, honorable senator. The murmuring doesn't add the substance to your point, you know. The, the murmur doesn't add the substance. I'm reading the authoritative Erskine Mays. The authority of an amendment may be either to modify a question in such a way as to increase its acceptability or to present to the House a different proposition as an alternative to the original question. Mr. Speaker, I don't think I need to read the balance. Finance Minister Camilla Dunsam strengthened the Prime Minister's argument that having a motion to debate the government's position is relevant and a necessary counteraction. So one would assume, Mr. Speaker, that a motion for no confidence falls within the ambit of any motion. Now, the second part that is cited, Mr. Speaker, as I understand it, is the issue of relevance. And it was said, as, as I under, and I'm, I'm asking for your assistance, Mr. Speaker, so if I'm wrong at any point, I, I stand corrected. There was a citation to Section 32 that said, where any motion is under consideration, um, the House may permit the amendment if it is relevant. And the argument I'm understanding is that there is no relevance to this particular case. But Mr. Speaker, if there is no relevance, then we cannot debate the motion of no confidence. Because the other argument on debate is that you cannot have a debate unless it is relevant to the subject at hand. So therefore, if someone gets up to have a motion of no confidence and say, the government is, is going to hell in a handbasket. And we get up and in our debate say, no, it is not going to hell in a handbasket. Clearly, it is relevant because you are discussing the same topic. The debate on the Constitution and the parliamentary procedures got very heated with a back and forth between members of Parliament and the Speaker of the House, Joma Thomas, who at times had to regain order. The protocol in this House is that when the Speaker is speaking, that the member who is speaking sit. Isn't that the protocol? That's what a protocol should be. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, but we know we violate it from time to time. Uh, yeah, yeah. But no, no. But Mr. Speaker, you're encouraging it. You okay. think I mean? Yeah, yeah. You're encouraging it. Yeah. Now, Mr. Speaker, we all agree we have a choice to make. How do you make the choice? You have to vote. How else you going to make the choice? You have, an, you, you have a motion. You have an amendment. Oskin say, you have to choose which one you're going to do it. How else would you choose? Mr. Speaker, you have to vote to choose. I done. I'm stating that because I'm at a loss as to why we're still in this position. Have we not yet concluded? Or we have not yet made a decision on how we're moving forward collectively? Honorable, honorable member, the people's business is important business. You may think that this is easy and simple. And quite frankly, quite frankly, it may be easy and simple for you. And I credit you for that level of genius. What, what, please sit, please sit. Please. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, please sit. I am making a point which I think is very important. In fact, I, this morning it I, was, it was, it was I who remember, said that this matter should not be trivialized. Sit. It was I who said that this matter should not be trivialized. I don't remember, please sit. But it seems as if that in this house, I am not allowed to make a point on a particular matter. Where the speaker of this house is having a grave, grave difficulty in arriving at a decision, that is the point I'm making. For two hours you have been deliberating on this matter and you cannot come to a conclusion. That's the point I'm making. Honorable, honorable, honor, honor, honorable Senator. Honorable Senator. Honorable Senator. I remember sometime in the first, sometime in the first year when I was made the speaker of this chamber, 
a member had a similar outburst and I told him that you have won I want you to know that you have had years but I Speak to him. Mr. But, Speaker. But speak to him or I will toss him. Mr. Speaker. It's in, you're basing the minds and the men's rear today yeah. with something that the Prime Minister said without consulting me. That is the, not the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister can't speak, Mr. Speaker, with respect. But, but how can you say that the Prime Minister, he doesn't have the moral or legal authority the, the, to speak on behalf of of Saboto Caesar at any place, at any time in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And you cannot, you do not know if I am going to vote with the opposition. So, so you don't know that. So, so, and well. until then, very well. A division is needed. Very well. That is all I am saying. And I do not wish for you to continue on that line about the historical issue, the Honorable Prime Minister. Let us take it to a vote. Honorable, Honorable, Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Minister of Agriculture, with all due respect, I think that presentation should be made, should have been made on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I think that you're making light no, I am of not. my presentation. Mr. Speaker, with respect, with respect, you are making very light of what I said. Yeah. I made a fundamental point. I understand. And for you, no, 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 Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I take it seriously what you just said. Turning to the issue of crime, Prime Minister and Minister of National Security, Dr. Ralph Gonsalves, told Parliament on Monday that his government continues to commit tremendous resources in addressing this issue. Prime Minister Gonsalves said the government considers crime fighting of critical importance, which is seen in its allocation of over 50 million EC dollars to the salaries of personnel involved in the role of security. The fire service, which is part of the security apparatus, $3.65 million. The Coast Guard service, $4.25 million. So for those three, is $41 million, over $41 million. And when you add the prisons, $5.7 million, you see your head is bumping up to $50 million to pay the salaries, to keep the business of the police, the vehicles running, pay for the telephones, and so on and so forth. $50 million. The police, the fire service, the Coast Guard, and the prisons. Dr. Gonsalves noted that the government's commitment to fighting crime can be seen in the total number of officers responsible for security, which stands at 1,200. Mr. Speaker, you turn to the fire services. You see there are 99 firefighters. You turn further to the Coast Guard services. Take out the, the cook and the, the, the typist and those sort of persons. You see you have 92 Coast Guard officers and you go over to prisons. You have 139 of them, 37 prison officers. You take out the, the clerk, typist and the typist. In total, Mr. Speaker, that's 1,238 persons on the front line addressing the issue of crime and national security in this country. In a small country of 110,000 persons, that is a good number. That is a good number. And anybody who wants to tell you otherwise, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. The Prime Minister added that the government will be increasing its spending in the area of security as the RSVG police force will be recruiting more officers to its service. You will see you have 910 
Why, Mr. Speaker? Because this year, there are 50 new constables whom we are going to recruit. 50. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, to increase the salaries alone for the constables from last year with these additional 51, 50 from 16.6 .6 million dollars to 17.7 million, another million dollars. I want the police to hear it. I want the people all over this country to hear it. That's what the opposition don't want here. That's where they run and gone. <laughs> Run, you can't hide. Minister of Health Luke Brown says Vincentians can look forward to continued improvements at healthcare facilities across SVG. Highlighting some of the accomplishments in the local healthcare sector, which was supported through funding under the 10th European Development Fund, the EDF, the health minister spoke of improvements at the Buckament Bay and Maricor Polyclinics and other health centers. And uh, this is the 10th EDF project for the modernization of the health sector. Under this modernization, we saw upgrades and renovations to the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital. Under this modernization recently, in December 2016, oh how time flies, we were able to open a much renovated, a substantially renovated mental health rehabilitation center. Under this modernization, we are going to have two spanking new polyclinics on different sides of the country. I see Sir Louis looking at me because he's anxiously awaiting the bolstering of healthcare on the leeward side with the Bukament Bay Polyclinic. And I, Jimmy ain't really watched me yet, but I know that he is also patiently awaiting what is going to happen in Maracua. Sorry, the, the Honorable Member for, for Maracua. <laughs> he is patiently awaiting what is going to happen for healthcare in Maracua with the polyclinic out there. Minister Brown said he is looking forward to improvements in the health information system as well as examining and implementing ways for our sustainable healthcare sector in SVG. And so on. And we are concerned about how we could provide medicines for persons in a sustainable way. And we have to do certain things, as reflected in the performance indicators, to manage better our medical supplies. And we have to make sure that 2018 is the year when we get it right as far as our health information system is concerned, so that we could track properly and efficiency efficiently what is going on with our stocks and supplies and of course there are other many other benefits related to getting these things going and one other very important component the conversation has started and it is best for elaboration of that conversation in the more full context of the budget debate has to do with sustainable financing for health so we talk about a review for instance of the fees at the hospital. We talk about national health insurance and the wheels are beginning to turn in relation to national health insurance. But naturally, there must be much study and much deliberation before we move in one direction or the next as far as national health insurance is concerned. Minister of Agriculture Saboto Caesar says the fisheries department will be engaged in measures to ensure they win the fight against illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing in the waters of SVG. Caesar told Parliament on Monday during his contribution to the 2018 budget estimates presentation that there is an increase in funds for the fisheries department and plans on the way to continue the fight against illegal, unregulated fishing. Speaker program number 465 on page 388, fisheries services. There is a slight increase in allocation over the previous year, an increase in the sum of $40,720. And this is to address mainly wages, which will go towards supporting our actions as a country as we continue to grapple with 
or fight against illegal, unre unreported, and unregulated fishing. And uh, our efforts are being supported by the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO of the United Nations. Minister Caesar also spoke of plans for improved maintenance of fisheries infrastructure, as well as an initiative aimed at ensuring the sustainability of lobster and conch. Improvement of fishery equipment and machinery on the program here for fisheries development, the sum of $400,000. Mr. Speaker, there are monies there allocated for a lobster and conch survey. As we see more persons getting into the exploitation of lobster and conch, we have to ensure that we do it in a sustainable manner. And we are going to conduct a lobster and conch survey. There are monies there also for minor works at the fishery centers. These fishery centers have now been leased and the minor works to be done prior to their opening. Also, work has to be done as it pertains to the maintenance of the fads, the fish aggregating devices. Taiwan's Foreign Affairs Minister David Tawi Lee will lead a five-member delegation on an official one-day state visit to SVG tomorrow, Thursday, February 1st. The Taiwanese delegation will be welcomed at the Agal International Airport by Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce, Sir Louis Straker. This is the first time that Minister Lee is visiting St. Vincent and the Grenadines. However, since the establishment of diplomatic relations between SVG and Taiwan in 1981, the Taiwan Technical Mission one year later in 1982, SVG has received previous visits by foreign ministers in 2013, 2005 and 2003. As part of the official state visit by the Taiwan diplomat, there will be a signing of a bilateral agreement on the capacity building project for the prevention and control of diabetes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the launching of the electronic document and records management system and PKI smart card system. The Diabetes Prevention and Control Agreement aims to provide assistance in planning effective integrated care strategies and practices on the prevention and control of the disease, while the introduction of the EDRMS is aimed at improving the public administrative efficiency and strengthening the information security for e-government applications. Over the past 37 years, various bilateral cooperation projects covering infrastructure, agriculture, education, information technology, health, human resource, among others, have been signed by both countries. Thursday's signing ceremony will commence at 3 p.m. at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Conference Room. The inmates at Her Majesty's Prisons at the Belle Isle facility are being given the opportunity to develop skills in culinary arts. Representatives of Ali's Culinary Arts have been sharing their time and knowledge with the inmates at the facility. Speaking with SVG TV News on this initiative was representative of Ali's Culinary Arts, Alvin, Chef Ali Jackson, who said the project was born out of a desire to help inmates get a second chance at life and expressed elation at the enthusiasm shown by the participants whole intention that is the whole idea behind this program so that when they get out right instead of to fall back into what they probably would have done before to get here that they would have something new a new a different skill that they could upgrade themselves and so far how have the, um, the inmates been doing have they them shown excellent skills in the kitchen tremendous tremendous if you um previous classes that we did before there you would have seen some of their presentation they come up with their whole, own idea of presentation how they present their stuff their plating you know the plating we teach them a bit of plating and they, they're doing really really good um, I must say I'm very very much impressed I'm proud of the way that they are adapting to this program assistant superintendent of prisons Brian Andrews said Several private sector stakeholders have been playing a role in assisting inmates gain various skills and consider the culinary arts program an important one. 
supply would be assisting with that. Um, yam, yam, um, TVEC would also be assisting us in um, upgrading our carpentry program, um, which would be coming on stream. Well, the carpenter shop is going all the time, but the upgrade part of it, the upgrade component of it, would be um, brought on stream in the near future. And, and we're hoping to bring other programs on stream as we we go along and, 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 and this all. We have a very young, we have a very young prison population and we want to ensure that when they get back um, into the society that they are prepared in some way or the other to get involved in development. Some of the inmates participating in the programs expressed delight with the opportunity provided to them. We've learned so far how to hold the knife properly, how to hold whatever you're cutting up properly so you won't cut yourself. We've learned how to prepare food, how to plate food, presentation and preparation. So right now we're here preparing a meal for the whole population. So I'm just cutting up some things right now. Well, I, me personally, I feel really great because I know if I was outside at the moment, it would have, I would have to pay. So I'm kind of glad right now I'm getting this training free of cost. And I know I can use this skill when I go out and achieve something in life. I find the program is very, is very optimistic, you know, it's very, very beneficial. Because since I'm here, I learned a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different stuff, like, you know, like how to stir fry, you know. Like, um, we have other recipe named the Spanish, the Spanish goat stew, you know. I find the program is very beneficial and very interesting. Yeah, yeah, because since I hear a lot, of a lot of different things like how to prepare, how to design, you know, all kind of stuff like that. I know. Wonderful program that they have in culinary arts, and I'm very interested in it. And one thing I love to eat, so that's why I'm mostly in it. Yes, I will continue when I go out and maybe get a walk down in the Grenadines because a skill like this, when you learn it, while being in the Grenadines, it's easier for you to get a walk as well.